1983, night, September 1st. A Korean Airlines Boeing was on an international flight from Anchorage to Seoul. There were 269 people on board. The flight was supposed to take place over neutral waters, but for unknown reason, the plane veered westward. It entered restricted Soviet airspace, flew over military objects, and then was shot down by an Su-15 fighter. It turned out later that the plane deviated the set course because of the navigation error. In this story, you can ask a number of questions to the Soviet side, at least why there were no attempts to contact the Boeing, but no matter what, the plane was shot down and 269 people on board were killed. To prevent similar navigational errors in the future, the U.S. government opened up access to military technology that we use to this day. Today, we will tell you about the history of this technology. GPS and the downed Korean plane. Are there many of our viewers who have ever used a paper map? If you are, be sure to write in the comments how you got by it in a dead end. The disadvantages of the map are obvious. It's big, inconvenient, and most importantly, impossible to use while driving. It could only give you a plan of the area and some landmarks by which you had to calculate your own geolocation. But there were no alternatives. They tried to put the map onto rollers and insert it into a device with a manual rewind. This helped reduce its size, but all other drawbacks remained. The first attempts were made by the Italians in 1932. The rollers were inserted into the dashboard of the car and scrolled automatically. The scrolling speed was synchronized with the speed of the car, but this system only worked if you were driving straight. After a turn, the rollers had to be changed, but nevertheless, it was some progress. There were no analogs to this system until October 4, 1957, when there was a revolution in another scientific field. The USSR launched the world's first satellite, which was called Sputnik 1. In Russian, Sputnik means satellite. Apparently, no one bothered with making up a name. About 60% of the total mass of the satellite was taken up by batteries, which fed two transmitters, which in turn sent a signal to Earth. By the way, those two batteries lasted only 21 days. The American scientists who received the signal were able to determine the orbit of the satellite and thought, hmm, if we knew the exact position of the satellite relating to the Earth, we could receive a signal from the satellite and know where we are. But that would require not one, but at least three satellites. We needed more powerful batteries, and they needed to be recharged somehow. So the idea was put on hold until better times. In the meantime, General Motors came up with its own idea, to dig in magnets every three miles on the road. According to the idea, there should be a device in the automobile which would read magnetic field and output the received information somewhere. It is easy to guess that no one wanted to dig up the roadway, and the idea was quickly abandoned. Another proposal was even more interesting. Special sensors which could read the speed of the wheel rotation were installed in a car. This was a computer in the trunk, which would calculate the location based on the speed, compass readings, and starting position, and display it on the TV. Seemed like a good idea, but let me remind you, it was the 60s. The scientists at that time were experimenting with transistors, but all the computers worked on vacuum tube. They're big, they're fragile, they're very hot, and the whole thing would have cost about as much as an airplane. And to power the whole system, you would have to take a power plant on a trailer. Anyway, that idea didn't take off either. In 1981, Honda was able to make this idea happen. It was called the Electro Gyrocator. It worked exactly as it was intended in the 60s. It could display geolocation on the TV screen, but due to the bad display resolution on the TV, it produced only a spot, and the map was drawn on a plastic plate, which had to be changed while driving. By the way, the cost of this navigation was about a quarter of the car price. Unfortunately, no one knows how many of those systems were sold. Later, there was a cheaper and better version. It also calculated speed and turns and displayed the results on the TV. It was able to display not only the spot, but the whole map, and the map was stored on, you'd be surprised, on cassettes. The map of Los Angeles, for example, was fit on four cassettes and you had to change them while driving. Imagine how many cassettes you'd need to travel around the country. But what about satellite navigation? Back in the 50s, scientists had invented how to determine one's location using satellites. Hadn't they developed this idea? Of course they had. Already in 1964, the U.S. put into orbit a number of satellites and launched the world's first satellite navigation system. It was called Transit. As in the USSR, no one bothered with the name. But why didn't anybody start to install it in cars right away? First of all, the system was designed for the Navy. Civilians got access to it only in 1967. Secondly, this system allowed to determine the location once an hour with an accuracy of 330 feet. It did not produce an image on the TV screen, but sent only numerical coordinates. And you had to enter the speed manually. Of course, it was very expensive. Not as expensive as a magnet buried every three miles, but still. Yet the technologies developed. 
Now, mankind has three full-fledged navigation systems, the Russian GLONASS, the Chinese Baidu, and our GPS. All of them are now not only helping the military as they once did, but also are used for peaceful purposes. The modern GPS system appeared in 1973, but as we said, back then it was only available to the military. Civilians could only use the outdated transit system. And now we come to the fateful day. Originally, we wanted to tell you about the evolution of navigation systems, but as we studied the material, we learned what event is behind the appearance of GPS in our phones. Well, or partly contributed to the introduction of this technology in civilian life anyway, and we decided to tell a little bit about this incident. To recall, it all happened on the night of September 1st, 1983. The plane was supposed to fly over the neutral waters of the Pacific Ocean, but went astray and entered the restricted airspace of the USSR over Kamchatka. Then it left, but re-entered soon after, but already over the Sakhalin Island. And this time, the Soviet aircraft which took off to intercept it had already shot down the Korean airliner. The next day, Soviet flags were burnt in Seoul. Not only in Seoul, but the whole world was proclaiming how ruthless the Soviet Union was. The Soviet Union, in turn, accused the United States of espionage and provocation, which was also quite likely. Ronald Reagan, who was the president of the United States at the time, accused the Soviet Union of all mortal sins. It got to the point that in one of his speeches he called the Soviet Union an evil empire. By the way, since then his expression has stuck with politicians, so Reagan could easily patent it. But let's leave the jokes aside, but the Cold War is a slippery business. And it was after that awful set of circumstances with the Korean plane that the confrontation began with the capitalist and socialist worlds reaching its highest boiling point. It seemed as if the whole world had been doused with gasoline and someone was about to strike a match. Also just a few years ago, the Soviets deployed troops into Afghanistan, which wasn't to the liking of the US. The possibility of the Cold War becoming a hot war arose, that very one in which there would be no winners. After all, the nuclear missiles of both superpowers had been put on high alert, and the generals had already moved from their offices to underground bunkers. Later, the investigation would find that the most probable reason for the deviation from the flight route was that the pilots hadn't set up the autopilot correctly and then didn't do the proper checks to get the current coordinates right. Thus, the violation of Soviet airspace was unintentional. This conclusion suggests either incompetence or negligence of the crew. As for the Soviet side's responsibility, the commission concluded that at the time of the order to destroy the plane, the Soviet Air Force thought it was dealing with an American spy plane RC-135, which is, in fact, a Boeing 739 and could be confused with the Korean 747. But the plane could not be checked thoroughly due to the time factor. The aircraft had to leave the Soviet airspace soon, and there was a lot to explore in those areas it was impossible to allow the disclosure of secret information. One shouldn't think that the heartless pilot immediately followed his orders dryly and fired missiles at the civilian airplane. Of course, he tried, according to the international rules of the time, to let the plane know that it had invaded Soviet airspace. For a start, he tried to forcibly land it. According to his words, he tried to make eye contact with the pilots of the Boeing. To do this, he went as close as he could to the Boeing and started flashing his signal lights. So he gave the signal, which by international rules at the time, said there was a border violation and demanded to make a landing. But the Boeing did not react. The pilot of the Soviet plane then fired warning shots from his cannon. However, for some reason, he did not fire tracer shells, but ordinary ones. It means that the chance the pilots would notice such shots was extremely small. The tracer rounds glowed, but the ordinary ones did not, and it was the middle of the night. Why there was no attempt to make radio contact isn't finally clear. All these events, of course, were classified, and while the world community was in ignorance, many alternative versions of what happened were born. Many of them sound quite realistic considering the situation of the time. We won't enumerate them, but if you want, you can ask the holy Google and dig up many interesting and sometimes even fantastic explanations of what happened. If people actually died, it's a very sad story, but there are some positive aspects. Japan, the USSR, and the United States, for example, created a unified, common system for tracking routes and aircraft movement over that part of the Pacific Ocean where controversial situations could arise. And most importantly, there was direct dispatch communication between the three countries. Of course, as Ronald Reagan promised after the crash, GPS became available for civilian use. Now with a smartphone in our pockets, we can find the point we need on the map in a few seconds and successfully get there. One day, looking at the navigator screen, maybe you'll remember that incident in the night sky over Sakhalin. If they had had satellite navigation, all that might not have happened. If everything was as the main version tells us, of course. Anyway, sometimes people make great sacrifices to develop something. Let's hope we learn to do without them. Thank you for your attention, and we'll see you soon.